Okay, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Portsmouth School Committee meeting of Tuesday, December 13th. Would you please rise and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence for our troops in harm's way? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Um, prior to this meeting, we had an executive uh, session. Uh, one vote was taken uh, regarding the matter of security and <laughs> passed um, 6-0. Madam Chair, just so we do have it on the agenda, we just wanted to do the additional moment uh, to recognize Christina Karagianis. Right. That. Thank you very much. Um, we did want to uh, take a moment. We had the passing of a teacher at the high school, uh, Christina Karagianis, um, recently, and recognize her for her service and what a what a bubbly personality, former PHS grad. Um, student, teacher, uh, neighbor, and uh, take a moment to recognize her. Thank you. It's a lovely picture. Um, can I now have a motion, please, to seal the executive session minutes of November 15th, 2022, and December 13th, 2022? So Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Uh, unanimous 6 0. Uh, please let the record reflect uh, that Mr. Payero is absent tonight on travel. Um, I, uh, I'm going to introduce a new member here in just a moment, but before I do that, in case of emergency, uh, we have exits here in the front and one here in the back, and we will meet over at the school admin uh, building. So uh, pleased to report uh, that uh, we have a newly uh, elected, uh, first time newly elected uh, school committee member here, Emily Skian. Uh, she, along with Sandra Blanc, Fred Farber, and Isabel Kelly, were all uh, sworn in at a ceremony at Town Hall on uh, November 28th, uh, Governor McKee doing the honors. And uh, we're all pleased that we have some re-elected members and a newly elected member. So just a round of applause for all of you joining us. And Emily, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you like to say a word? And if you do, you have to turn your mic on. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I do have a little one at the Hathaway Public School and um, really been so pleased with the community of Portsmouth. I'm a lifelong uh, public school graduate through and through and um, hoping to learn more and, and hopefully serve the community. Thank you. We're, we're pleased you're, you're willing to step up, right? <laughs> it takes a little bit of time to serve on the school committee. So uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the effort and the continuing effort of our um, uh, reelected members. Okay, so now on to our favorite portion of the evening, which is recognitions. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. Uh, so we are pleased this evening to be able to recognize uh, several Portsmouth High School students who are part of our Model United Nations team. Uh, so they are led by uh, Mr. Joe Cassidy, who's here tonight as well. And it uh, seems like every year uh, Mr. Cassidy is uh, here uh, with, with students, and this year is no exception. Uh, they had Three competitions in the fall, one at UConn, one at Brown University, and one at NYU. Uh, so the recognitions uh, this evening reflect awards that students uh, won at each of those competitions. Um, so I'm just going to uh, read them in the order I have. I believe we may have some students who couldn't make it uh, tonight. So uh, and if you hear your name, please come up and receive your award. Uh, <laughs> All right, so first up, we have Henry White. He's here. 
So Henry at UConn received the Betts Betty Hansen Award and at the Brown competition uh, was uh, the best uh, delegate award winner. Uh, Ashley Murphy. And Ashley received the Best Delegate Award at the UConn competition and an honorable mention at NYU. Ariana Williams. Ariana received the Outstanding Delegate Award at the UConn competition. Uh, Morgan Levro who's not here. Uh, so Morgan received uh, best delegate at both the Brown and NYU competitions. Uh, Audrey Pham, also not here. Aud Audrey received the best delegate uh, award at the Brown competition. Uh, Luke Carlin, swim meet, all right. Uh, Luke received the outstanding delegate at award at UConn and also a verbal accommodation at the Brown Conference. Uh, Kiera Boxell. Kiera received the Best Delegate Award at the NYU Conference. Michaela Boxell. Michaela received Outstanding uh, Delegate at the NYU Conference. And Luke Voigt, Luke is not here, received a verbal accommodation at NYU. So I, as Mr. Cassidy makes his way up, um, we have some uh, team recognitions as well. Uh, so the team of Morgan Levero, Henry White, Audrey Pham, and Luke Carlin won best small delegation at Brown. And the team of uh, Morgan Levero, Ariana Williams, Kiara Boxell, Michaela Boxell, Ashley Murphy, and Luke Voigt won outstanding small delegation at NYU. So quite a lot of accomplishments. Congratulations. And any more competitions left or? So our plan is for uh, Bosman, Boston University, Model Year in February, which is just three weeks down to 15 weeks. Um, our expectation is just two members. And then they've got one more plan for the spring. At the moment, the club is up for now. All right. Good, Good luck. <laughs> right. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, bring these guys up. They have never failed to make themselves um, this group. I had a couple years of virtual conferences and finally got the chance to go back out there and perform in person. And I didn't have no expectations coming in, and it was, it was just incredible. So I wouldn't mind if you guys want to hear from them. So So I'll, I'll talk about UConn a little bit, and then I'll pass it to the others to talk about the other two conferences, but uh, it was more of a learner's conference. It was our first conference that we did all year, uh, so we were just kind of getting ready. Uh, this was actually only my second time in person, that conference, and I think it went really well. Uh, we got a lot of awards, really, uh, for how small of a delegation we were in that uh, field, uh, and I'm really happy with our performance there. Uh, I personally won this Betty Hansen Award, which I'd never seen presented before, but it was the best delegate of the entire conference, which not, not to brag, but I was, I was pretty happy with that one. Um, so they called me up when my little group, my room, it, they're called, they're called rooms. 
uh, when my room was being given awards, they called me up and they were like, oh, sorry, actually just go sit down. And they went through everybody else, every other room in the entire conference and gave everybody their awards. And at the very end, they were like, all right, we'd like to call Henry up. Uh, and they gave me a little plaque that had a gavel on it. And it was a great experience, really. So. Um, hi, my name is Michaela Boxel, um, and so I'll talk about Brown University's conference. Um, so as you all know, Brown University is a very prestigious um, Ivy League university. So um, as such, the, the conference there is very competitive, very difficult. Um, some of the best high schools in um, the New England area and in the country, um, and even in the world sometimes, come to Brown University to compete. Um, so for us to have won um, such a high award is really just such an honor. We all really did. We all showed out at um, Brown University. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, UConn was a learner's university, but Brown is where we really, you know, took the things we've learned over the years and at UConn um, and put them to good use. Um, yeah, overall, I just want to thank the committee for, you know, consistently letting us do these conferences. Um, and I hope that we will continue to make you guys proud in the future. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Kira Boxel, um, and I'll talk about NYU, which was the last conference that we went to just a few weeks ago. Um, so it's at New York University, which was an amazing experience for all of us, um, especially since most of us hadn't been to New York before. And it was really cool, you know, being able to see the school, um, even interact with some of the students sometimes. And I guess I'll talk a, a little bit about my room in particular, so you like can get a feel of what Mod UN can be sometimes. Uh, so I was in a crisis committee, which is... Um, they're a little different from the typical like general assembly that you think of when you think of the UN, the UN. Uh, but it was really fun. It was about the Italian unification in 1850. Um, and I was initially the minister of war, <laughs> um, but I ended up as a communist populist um, leader of the um, populist movement in the country, which is not historically accurate, but you know, that's how it goes sometimes. Um, and that was the room that I won best delegate in. So I think you see how um, what Mod UN can be about. It's not necessarily, um, you know, all historical accuracy, but it is always about diplomacy and working with other people um, and really just learning your strengths and um, how to work with other people in a way that, um, you know, everyone can get something out of. Um, and so you can win sometimes. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, overall, um, all the conferences that we went to were really amazing experiences for everyone. And I would like to thank you all for allowing us to continue going on them. Thank you. Um, so we're kind of all out of talking points because that was all the conferences that we went to this year. So I have to come up on the fly. Um, this is my first like real year doing this. I started like really late last year. So um, UConn was my second ever um, conference. So it was really fun to learn. I enjoy the type of arguments that you do. And I feel as though they help you like past argument um, abilities, but they also help you in all your classes. They help you be able to voice your opinions articulately and get your point, your points across, which I feel is an invaluable skill, um, especially as like a female. I feel like that is really important for me to learn. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Cassidy for giving me the opportunity <laughs> to learn how to do these things because I feel like it's a unique way to learn. Um, it's definitely a fun way and an expensive way to learn, um, but I feel like it is well worth it. Um, and I would also like to thank you guys for allowing us to continue having these like amazing opportunities. Um, I feel like they'll be repaid further than the money that my parents spend on these <laughs> adventures. Thank you. Um. As Ariana said, I kind of already ran out of talking points, but um, I just kind of want to like really highlight the growth that we had. You know, I can't speak from previous years, but I did do it last year. And I know like myself, I wasn't really winning awards and I didn't really feel confident in the rooms. Um, but at UConn, you know, being a learner's conference, it was like a really big thing, like to build my confidence. And it definitely helped through the other three. You know, um, we did out of the three conferences we did this year, we, you know, we won best delegate or best, best delegation and outstanding delegation which is something that we weren't like really winning last year as a delegation. I think that we've all grown so much because of these conferences. And I just really wanna thank all of you for allowing us to do these. Well, I think it's a, a very, very impressive delegation you brought to the uh, school committee to kind of convince us that we still need to be approving these trips, right? 
Well done. Well played. <laughs> I didn't think it was that transparent. Um, I do need to say that this is just a small representative of the team at large. We have over 20 delegates this year. And for most of these conferences, just because of limitation of transportation, we bring 12. Um, in my opinion, it's stacking the deck. And normally, I just sort of put them in position to succeed and get out of their way. And as you can see, and two of our captains weren't able to make it tonight. They had other commitments. But you've got an amazing group of kids. And just this community, um, the fact that you guys and them at large have supported us this whole time is much appreciated. Uh, we began this program in 2009. And back then, I was learning as much from them as they ever got from me. Um, it's just nice to see that it's continued. Uh, we've continued to expand the program. Kids come in uh, and seem to know what it's about, which I used to have to spend two or three meetings just explaining it to them. So to some extent, they grow their own. And, you know, Ashley, for all of her, I didn't win it all last year. She was a freshman last year. And this is her. This is the poise that she's gained by her sophomore year. I can't wait to see what these guys do over the next two years. Uh, so I'm excited for my seniors. They've had a great year already, regardless of what we do in the spring. And then I'm really excited for the kids coming up. And, you know, this will be my last year again, kids. So um, at some point, they're going to have to find somebody else that gives up their weekends. But for now, it's still me. Uh, I appreciate the acknowledgement for these guys. They certainly deserve it. And I hope you have fun for the rest of the night. I just I just want to compliment uh, Joe Cassidy on the memo that you wrote because um, I don't imagine your students saw that memo, but it was it was full of comparable phrase uh, to the words that he just spoke, and um, it also put the uh, significance and and um, importance of continuing this program and the success that you've had over the years. I just I just found it a very informative memo, and I know it took a lot of time to put it together, so I just wanted to compliment you on it. And. You know, I'd just like to add, um, Model UN is always near and dear to my heart. Back 150 years ago when I was in high school, I spent my entire high school career doing Model UN. And um, two of my very close friends from my class went into the foreign service after that. Uh, one of them ended up as a diplomat in Vienna and actually helped Dag Hammarskjöld write his memoirs. And the other one um, eventually became the ambassador to Albania and then the ambassador to Poland before he retired. So it's, you know, you guys are following in great footsteps and have tremendous opportunities coming out of this activity. So congratulations to all of you. And you do us all proud. <laughs> And, and we, we also totally understand if you have homework and things you need to do tonight and don't want to hang around for the whole meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of an unusual uh, meeting because it follows um, an election and a certification of new members. Um, so we do have a, a brief organizational um, meeting that we need to do first. Our bylaws require that we elect a chair, a vice chair, um, and a clerk. Um, so at this point, uh, can I have a motion for discussion and action on the election of the clerk, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, and I think I turn this over to Marianne for nominations because I'm the chair. The chair? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Did we say, did I say clerk? Clerk? Clerk. Clerk. clerk? Oh, I'm start with clerk. I, okay. Can That's you table you... that motion for a minute? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got to start so, with the chair. I, I blew it. Over. So, so I move for discussion and action on the election of the chair, and I nominate Emily Copeland for chair. <laughs> second. second. Thank you. I always feel odd voting for myself, you know. <laughs> now it goes back to me. Thank you. Now I'll try not to blow this one. Can I have a motion, please, for discussion and, and action on the election of vice chair? So moved. Second. And I nominate uh, Juan Carlos Payero as vice chair. Is second. there a second? Second. Second. And this is the danger of not being at a meeting. You get, a, you get nominated for an office. Are there any other nominations? I have to ask three times. 
Are there any? No, I don't. Okay. Um, all those in favor of uh, Juan Carlos Payero as vice chair, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Unanimous 6 0. Moving on to C, may I have a motion for discussion and action for the election of the clerk? So moved. Second. Uh, I nominate Karen McDade for the uh, um, clerk. Second. Are there any other nominations? Would anybody else like to second? <laughs> I'm joking. Um, okay. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous 6 0. Congratulations, Karen. Um, okay. We also have to reapprove uh, re our adoption of our bylaws. So, can I have a motion, please, for discussion and action on the adoption of the bylaws? So moved. Any discussion? There were no changes. All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous 6 0. Uh, we also have to reappoint or appoint legal counsel. May I have discussion, please? Discussion and action for appointment uh, as Marianne Carroll as legal counsel to serve at the pleasure of the school committee. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous 6 0. Thank you, Marianne. I hope you agree. <laughs> um, that would have been <laughs> awkward, wouldn't it? Um, we, uh, this is not an action item, but we have the establishment of the meeting date and time. And in the backup, we had our schedule of school committee meetings. So that, um, unless there are any, we can't really make any changes because it's not an action motion. But if anybody would like changes to that, uh, please let me know and we can put those on for the next meeting. And then the final um, action is subcommittee assignments, which are appointed. And um, I'm pleased to report that um, Emily Skian has uh, volunteered to take on uh, membership in the policy subcommittee, uh, replacing Tom Vadney, uh, who finished his term. And Carlos Payero has agreed to be chair of the negotiations subcommittee. Um, and we have, uh, from our last listing, we have removed the ad hoc transportation representative and the technology rep because we don't really use those. And we've added on there the district building committee, which is the committee, which is a broader committee with the town um, and community on our bond. And uh, Sandra Blank as um, chair of the capital uh, improvement committee and myself as chair of the school committee have been um, serving as members of that. So there is our current subcommittee uh, membership and um, meeting schedule. Okay, that takes care of all of our organizational business. And now on to our subcommittee uh, updates. Uh, for the building committee, I'm gonna ask the superintendent uh, to please give that report. Thank you. So our uh, last building committee meeting was held on November 16th. So it was right after our, our last school committee meeting. Um, and again, that is a, a monthly meeting that we have with uh, town and school representatives, our um, owner's project manager, Paragon Group, and uh, architectural consultant, Studio Jade, also attend. Uh, items E through I on the uh, business uh, agenda this evening uh, were all approved at that uh, building committee meeting in November. And the next meeting is coming up uh, this okay, Wednesday, tomorrow. tomorrow. Correct. Okay. Um, equity subcommittee uh, and assistant superintendent uh, Viveros is co-chair of that and Mr. Payero is not here tonight. So Dr. Viveros. Thank you. The equity subcommittee met on November 17th. We had a good turnout with representation from each of our schools parents and community members. Uh, we discussed the status of the current school teams that we're developing at the elementary, middle and high school levels. Uh, we determined that this year's, uh, our focus is going to be um, equity as it relates to diverse needs, gender and race. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for January 30th at 3.30. And at that meeting, we're going to be reviewing our current uh, committee policies that are connected to equity and possibly make recommendations for some changes. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and the final subcommittee was the personnel subcommittee, uh, which met last Friday. And no, C is personnel. Next. Because um, as I'm chair of the personnel subcommittee, 
And um, we approved uh, for the full committee's consideration uh, business C, uh, which is the contract renewal for our director of finance for your consideration. And now uh, the finance subcommittee, Mr. Ferber. So the finance committee met this afternoon just before this, uh, before our executive session. And it's basically the kickoff meeting for the um, new budget year. And we basically acknowledge some of the issues that we have to contend with this year, which most importantly is inflation, but also uh, we don't know what state aid is going to be for this year. So that's a, a mystery as it usually is at this time of the year. And um, what was the other one? Oh, the enrollment, the Little Compton enrollment has dropped a little more than we anticipated. So we've got some, some uh, issues that right off the bat, we have to, um, to be wary of going forward. But otherwise, it's a typical budget year with a, a lot of unknowns. And um, also, some of our contracts are tied to the consumer price index. So that's an issue that we have to contend with as well. That, that, that's where the inflation hits us most. That's it. So can we buy lottery tickets? <laughs> <laughs> I've, often, I've often thought that, that we should buy you know? just one ticket. You know? <laughs> Perpetual, to, perpetual to number. Dow the school committee or I mean, something of schools. Four hundred million. The mega is at four hundred million right now. The, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that wasn't thinking that, but you know, even ten dollars, you know. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Ferber. Are there uh, any um, requests for public comment? No. Thank you. Um, moving on to our PHS liaisons communication. Welcome tonight. Um, is it on? Hello? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Patsy Little, treasurer on the executive board. I'm Fiona Daly, I'm the vice president. And we're here for some updates. You wanna start? Yeah, so um, earlier in November, we took part in the nationwide Covenant House sleep out to raise funds and awareness for homeless teenagers which was a really great experience. And we paired with the Social Justice Club and the Intersexuality And yeah, it, we, had, um, we had a speaker come in from the housing hotline on the island and we did a lot of other like informational activities. All right. Uh, next, about two weeks ago, we did get the unfortunate news of the passing of Miss Kara Janice. She was also a very close family friend of mine. But um, in response to that, uh, me, I, I started a um, kind of like an art project uh, for kids to express their like creative freedom at the high school. And we covered the entire high school with butterflies. They're absolutely everywhere. That was a... Um, kind of like a sign that represented her. So we had uh, students during advisories make butterflies, origami butterflies, and we had the um, art wing or like the art wing open for students to make butterflies if they had like a free period or if they wanted to stay after school. So we got the entire school covered with butterflies, which is really sweet. And I had her family walk the halls today. Um, we've also been doing a lot of like different drives and we just had like an art supplies drive for children and we have a toy drive for Christmas upcoming this week and we're working on some other ones. And then we had last weekend we had the school play clue it was like a murder mystery. It went really well we had there was a lot of sales for it and it I was went. Fiona went <laughs> I couldn't make it um, and that was running Friday night and Saturday night. And also our winter sports have begun. Um, boys and girls basketball has been doing really well. I know there's a swim meet tonight and indoor track. And yeah, I don't know the other ones. Bas oh, girls gymnastics. I gymnastics. gymnastics. <laughs> Boys and girls basketball, yeah. Um, next week on the 22nd, we're going to have our uh, another blood drive. We had one back in September. We had a lot of people go. We had, I think, like, 35 people go yeah. cannot show up but hopefully we'll have as many people or even more show up this time around and then our last thing is that we have midterms coming up in january so we're just starting to prepare for those and that's it thank, thank you. you thank you appreciate the updates <clears throat> i think Ms. mcdade you went to clue the other night didn't you? i did it was delightful really fun yeah 
Okay, appreciate it, ladies. Um, moving on to our superintendent's update, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so first up, I have uh, personnel updates since our last meeting. Um, we have welcomed several new hires. Um, Cassandra Zaragoza as a clerical uh, C staff member at Portsmouth High School, Ariana Segura, teacher assistant at Portsmouth Middle School, Hannah Kennedy, uh, also joined the clerical staff at Portsmouth High School, Andrea Sams, school nurse assistant at PHS, Vincent LaSala, uh, building substitute at Melville, and Ashley Sherman, a general school aide at Hathaway. Um, had a few resignations as well, Nicole Farrier, general school aide at Hathaway, uh, Mr. Steve Tresvant, our Director of Athletics, has officially uh, resigned. Robin Daya, art teacher at Melville, and Caitlin Murray, uh, science teacher at Portsmouth Middle School. And we have uh, several um, final additions to our winter uh, coaching ranks. Uh, Samara Gallian, JV assistant coach for girls basketball. Alex Dodan, volunteer coach for boys basketball. Mario Ochi, assistant coach for boys basketball, Robert uh, Bial Lawa, volunteer coach for boys basketball, Kate Ziegler, volunteer coach for girls basketball, Margaret McCaffrey, assistant coach for girls indoor track and field, uh, Greg Cunningham, head coach for boys hockey, Matt Chappelle, assistant coach for boys hockey, and Wesley Lamar, assistant coach of boys basketball at PMS. So those are our uh, personnel updates. On to district updates. Uh, the first trimester of the school year has ended from Melville and Hathaway. So this follows uh, the quarters uh, at the middle and high school. Our elementary schools work on trimesters. Uh, so those first report cards for our elementary students uh, have gone home. Uh, in addition, students in grades four through nine, so those are students who would have taken RICAS last spring in grades three through eight, uh, they should have received the parent report uh, that went along with the uh, RICAS assessment results that we had the report out on our overall results at the uh, last school committee meeting, as you know, and uh, there are individual results that, that go out to families. Uh, this year, the state level reports also include individualized video messages uh, that have been tailored to uh, each student, apparently. Uh, any parent who has questions on either of these items should contact the main office of their child's school. Our winter athletic season, as we heard, is underway at both the middle and high school. Good luck to all of our teams and student athletes. Just a reminder, you can follow all athletic events on our new PSD Athletics app. And uh, many of our games are also live streamed on uh, WPHS Live, our YouTube channel. Uh, tomorrow, December 14th, will be an early release day for all schools, so each school will dismiss one hour early and staff will be scheduled for professional development time in the afternoon. And then just a reminder that all schools will be closed as of Friday, December 23rd uh, through January 2nd uh, for the holiday break and New Year, so we will reopen schools on Tuesday, January 3rd. Uh, tomorrow evening, uh, we've been advertising, we will be holding a parent safety forum. So parent and guardians are invited uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in the PHS auditorium. We'll have representatives from Portsmouth Police and Fire who will be joining school and district leaders. And we will provide an overview of our uh, safety procedures uh, to be followed by a question and answer period. And lastly, uh, for our school committee members, just a reminder that our uh, fiscal year 24 budget kickoff with uh, the Portsmouth Town Council is scheduled for January 23rd. Prior to this session, we will be meeting. It has been confirmed with our local uh, legislators as well to discuss legislative priorities. So just a reminder that at our next school committee meeting on January 17th, we will need to finalize uh, what you consider to be your legislative priorities. And then you should have been receiving information. There is a required ethics training for town and school officials on January 30th. And unless anyone has any questions, that is uh, it for district updates. What are these individual personalized videos? Who does those? I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, it's I haven't had a chance to see one. I don't know if you yeah, did. It's, yeah. It's it's just a little video that kind of explains the entire assessment. And then it's um, personalized as far as the, the child's scores are there. And then it shows them where they compare to the rest of the students and the rest of the state. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Ryan was really touting it. I think it's information that, you know, parents 
do we have typically received a very detailed individualized report? And now there's, uh, I think it's a QR code for a video link. I should probably go on and check out my own children's. <laughs> reminded, I, I just keep forgetting. Um, so uh, am I, did I hear you correctly that at the 23rd with that joint meeting, the legislative legislators are gonna be there as yes. well? Yes, yep. That was confirmed at the town council meeting last night. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? No? All right, um, moving on to our presentations from 22 AP, the 2022 AP results and PHS program of studies. Welcome. Thank you, hello. All right, so I've got mine in paper copy in front of me. Um, Heather, are you my slide guru? All right, so we'll start with table of contents. Um, tonight, we'll talk about curriculum updates for 2223. Then we'll look at new course proposals for 2324. We'll also do a quick review of our 2022 AP data. Right. So, our program of studies, of course, opens with our uh, beliefs about learning. So, we wanted to start our presentation with our beliefs about learning at Portsmouth High School. And we believe that we are all members of a safe, supportive, and accepting community that all community members have unique talents to contribute, that all community members are responsible for teaching and learning, all students have access to a diverse, verified, and reliable curriculum with authentic learning opportunities, and all students will have the opportunities to explore ideas and achieve. If you have a live copy of the presentation, this graphic here would take you to a digital copy of our draft program of studies, but I do believe that you all have a hard copy of that in front of you. Uh, so we'll start just with some updates for the current school year that we're in. Um, so as you probably know, we are in year one of our full implementation of study sync in our English department. Um, we're working very closely collaborating with uh, Tan and Longway, who is our district uh, literacy coach, as well as with Erin Healy, who is our instructional systems coach at the high school to support our English teachers with the impl implementation of the Greenlit curriculum from RIDE. Um, it's going well, you know, adoption of a new curriculum is, is difficult um, and, uh, across the board and our teachers do take their craft very personally. So right now they're working with adopting what is a very sort of prescriptive curriculum with their own style and they're doing a great job with that so far. Um, and one of the things that we're working on right now is balancing the use of thematic studies with novel studies because uh, study sync is very much driven by the thematic units and our teachers do feel that the novel studies are also a very valuable part of the learning experience. Uh, in our health and PE programs, uh, they're very proud, Mr. DeMarco couldn't be here tonight, but he's very proud of the fitness boot camps. Um, you know, post COVID, we're really looking at opportunities and creative opportunities for students to earn credits. Um, and so PE is a place where we're trying to get creative and physical education is important in all aspects of your life. And so looking at what that just not being part of necessarily a group of 25 kids doing jumping jacks, it's they're doing these very personalized boot camp kind of experiences. Um, they're also, which I think is very cool, um, students in grades 10 and 12 are being certified as Red Cross first responders. Um, I was walking down the E-Wing today and actually saw the, the dummies where they were practicing their CPR. In our science department, um, we've just made a few minor tweaks to the description of our AP Physics 1 program that just makes sure that we're in alignment with the college board's description of the programming. Um, we have added a prerequisite to our space and ocean science course to uh, the, with the successful completion of Algebra 1 because there is a lot of mathematics computation in that course and students we found who weren't finding success in that course, it was largely based on their algebra competency. Um, we've added a biotechnology foundation course for grades 9 and 10. Um, and the issues in biotech, which is the second in the sequence course offering, is available for grades uh, 10 and 12, and students can actually earn up to three URI EEP credits for that course. For math, I'd actually like to invite our math department chair, Evan Denard, who's here tonight, uh, to talk a little bit about some of his proposed new courses for the next school year. And he's super nervous because he's missing a swim meet to be here. <laughs> yeah, that's um, 
It's where a couple of my kids, I'm glad they chose me over Mr. Cassidy for once. Um, so for mathematics program, we are looking at several. Um, we are looking at introducing the business and marketing course next year. It would be one semester course paired with our current personal finance course. The personal finance course currently satisfies the state requirement for that financial literacy. So we pair it together as a full year course. Um, it would be an introductory course that's kind of dealing with kind of the business structure, looking at sole proprietorships, corporations, kind of corporations, C-Corps versus S-Corps, and talk about marketing, um, the different kind of marketing mixes and cost advantage versus a differential advantage on different products for kids to kind of just get the basic ideas of out there. Um, looking at intellectual property rights, kind of other government regulation rights. Moving from there, that kind of business Mindset introductory, we're looking at introducing a financial accounting course uh, proposed for 24-25, not next year, but the year after. It would be a kind of an EEP where students can uh, earn three URI credits um, with that. Um, and then the final one, which is currently running the Business Leadership Entrepreneur class, it is a semester course. And as I'm teaching that this year, I'm realizing that there's so much in there. Um, we can't kind of help these kids become entrepreneurs in just a short amount of time. So we are gonna expand it to a full year course. And that is the one where we are going to offer the work-based learning hours and getting them out into the community and kind of with partners and mentors to kind of foster that business mindset. If it's a specific to this course, I think it's appropriate to ask now for Evan. Okay. That's fine. So the the learning hours are those part of those? Would those fit some of that graduation requirement for? Um, yes, they would be. Yep. And so these three courses essentially will become our new kind of business pathway and kind of become the foundation for the academy for business. So it would be those work based hours would qualify for that graduation. For that graduation, okay. Great. And do you need? Is is this all being taught with existing staff? The business leadership entrepreneur class currently is um, next year with the intro to business and marketing with current faculty, kind of where we're at right now with Mr. Rose being on that TOSA position, uh, depending on what happens next year, but we will definitely, we have a one-year position. I think that would need to get folded into our operating budget um, to kind of keep the number of teachers we currently have in the department in order to run these classes, as well as our current offerings. Um, with the financial accounting at 24, 25, that may require further discussion about needing additional personnel. Um, is this similar to the CTE program where they would, it would result in a certificate for the students? I think down the line, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so uh, technically math and computer science do fall under Mr. Denard, but I'll let him off the hook for this one. <laughs> so um, we are hoping to uh, reintroduce um, a computer science principles class, um, but we'd like to make an AP offering out of it going forward. Um, we have Ms. Patterson who is qualified to teach that course. Um, it has run in the past under Project Lead the Way. Um, this is a slightly different take on that, um, but it would be a one-to-one -one replacement for our game design with this rule basic. So no staffing or scheduling implications there, but an additional AP offering for our students. And speaking of AP and EEP, um, we'll jump into the, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm gonna jump into the AP capstone. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that uh, Charlotte North is here with us. She was hired this year as our student exhibition coordinator. And she proposed uh, an idea that we love and we would love to have your support for this program. And it's an AP capstone program. Um, and so we would envision this running sort of parallel to our existing student exhibition program. Um, student exhibition is a, require, a graduation requirement for students who are not in a pathway or a CTE program, um, but this also offers them potentially an AP option to satisfy that capstone graduation requirement. It's a two-year program, so if we were to be approved, of course, we would start next year with year one of AP seminar, and then we would move into AP research, um, and then that could students could potentially satisfy the performance-based graduation requirement 
that we currently have with student exhibition by completing the AP capstone. The next big topic that we want to talk about for next year that we're really, really excited about, we also have uh, Ms. Jessica Slocum here with us in the audience, um, is what we're hoping to move forward with, which we're calling our Community Learning Center. Um, and what we're looking at here is it, the reality is we know that post-COVID, we've lost some kids. We have, we have, there are some kids who have just disengaged from school and we want them back. Um, and so what we're looking at are creative options to re-engage our students who, and, and it's a small population, we're looking at this as, as really sort of a tier three support for students. Um, but we're looking at, again, creative ways for students to earn credits, doing things that they're already doing that are learning <laughs> and that are based in deep learning, but that are also based in their interests because we know we have to engage them to get them into school and then we'll get them learning and we'll get them the credits that we need from there. Um, so we're really excited. We're very much in a developmental phase with this program. But the, the vision is that it would be, it would run parallel to our existing ALP, alternative learning program, um, which in its current form is a high level of support for students who can still kind of attend and do the day-to-day -day things that are expected of a student at Portsmouth High School. This program would be a little bit more alternative, frankly, and, and would look at more creative ways. And admittedly, we're not sure exactly what all of those creative solutions are right now, but we're looking at a lot of options. Um, and Ms. Slocum comes to us from the Met, where they have looked at lots of creative options for graduation requirements. And so we do feel very lucky to have her with us so that we can utilize her expertise and her background to support students who really admittedly are in triage mode that we we know they need to graduate and we want to make sure that they graduate with us and get a PHS diploma. So that's, and we're looking at community learning center in, so CLC will be another acronym to add to the alphabet soup. <laughs> okay, if there's, are there any questions about the program of studies before I jump into AP data? Ms. Kean. Um, with the community learning center, um, you kind of mentioned, I know there there's, like public service, um, but with the, like the entrepreneurship AP, like the idea of working not just with a business, but like the nonprofits that are in the community, I think a lot of the um, could be applicable to this community learning center model as well, like helping MLK center, you know, the communities that these students could relate to, but could serve not only their education, but the community um, as well. I would agree. And Ms. Slocum has some really, really great creative ideas for how we can leverage community partners, but also match that with student interests. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions on the uh, capstone uh, thing here. So this is a Two two year course, so full year courses each year. One's a seminar, and one's research. But I don't understand what collaborative performance tasks are. I'm going to ask Ms. North to come up and speak to that just a little bit. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so the first course creates the um, opportunities to learn the kinds of skills, the reading, the analysis that students are going to need to do an individual project the second year. So the collaborative tasks, um, it's a series of units that are based on real world questions and students do readings and view um, speeches and watch, you know, look at art and use things from multiple um, perspectives, multiple genres to um, then recommend a solution to a real world, world question. And so that's why it's both collaborative and individual. Um, so, so it might, do they, do, would you put out the themes like plastic waste or you it's know, actually, it, it's a criminal justice reform or something it's a like that? It's from um, AP. So they provide a lot of really great resources and the assessment for it is a mix of things that the teacher grades um, using the AP rubrics, the AP um, criteria. And then there's an exam for that first semester course that is an AP exam that's graded at AP. 
Did you know, does that count for like English? Is that like a English AP credit or a, what kind um, of, what's some, a, if it translates schools, to the college level? In some schools it? it can be. Um, it either can act as an elective or as a core English class in some schools. Mm -hmm. Here it would be um, an elective and a way to reach the performance um, sure. assessment yeah. um, graduation requirement. And then the the uh, the research portion would be um, would be an entire year on one re one fifteen page paper. Um, it seems a little light. It does, um, but it is so sorry, actually <laughs> well. You know what? It, it's depending on the student's project. There's also an applied um, aspect of the research. So um, in the same way that senior projects currently do. Um, I, I will admit I have not looked at as closely at the second course, but it um, it is what's very different about it from the way senior project is being done in, I think, districts in the state right now is the degree of rigor and the degree of research that would be expected to ground the work that students would be doing. So it um, that's why I'm especially excited about the two year sequence, because the first year you're creating the community of learners, you're creating the ways of approaching questions, the ways of looking for um, good evidence, relevant evidence, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, cherry picking the best things that fit what I already decided. So um, I, I think it's a really exciting opportunity to deepen the opportunity for students who really want to um, have a substantial yeah, and they, they are existing AP courses in many schools. So the curriculum would follow what the college board lays out for those courses. And we are going to tease just a little bit that our goal would be in a couple in two years from now that we would be able to offer this to sophomores, which would be sort of their toe in the water, which right now their toe in the water is our AP US history. And so we think that Ideally, we'd love to get our sophomores have this be one of their first exposures to advanced placement, which sort of exposes them to the rigor and the skills that you need that transfer across other AP classes. And we think that in addition to adding a level of rigor to our current PBGR, it would also help to support students who are interested in AP and start building those skills a little bit earlier than they are right now. I think it's a great, I mean, I think it's really exciting. I just worry that you know, just thinking back to my my own kids' schedule, you know, if they want to fit in, you know, history and social studies and band and everything else, and these are full year courses, I, I just want, I mean, I'm just, I, I wonder if it couldn't be, but you say they're, that's the way the AP is running it. It would seem to me like if you did a yeah. half year seminar and a half year There project, may be flexibility on how they're scheduled. I'm not sure on that. I just, I know that they're their existing AP courses in, in other schools. Um, yeah. you know, we're not inventing these, these right, AP courses. Right, no, I mean, so. it is exciting. It's just they only have so many credits and, you know, if they don't take this, they might not take biology or something, you know, so. Yeah, I think that's a fair. For um, like a bachelor of science, capstone is very common to have like a real research thesis project. So perhaps, Again, I don't know, but if there's like a research project over the summer that could qualify for credit, because a lot of um, like URI, other um, science research universities have like summer research projects for high school students. Yeah, I think, you know, we're very much in a an exploratory phase right now with this, and I think that you know, colleges run things on a semesterized schedule. So I, I, I'm sure that we could probably petition the AP board, uh, the college board and see if there is flexibility with that. Because certainly we wouldn't want to preclude kids from taking other classes by having them have this in their schedule. Um, but I also do think, as you'll see, this gives students sort of another opportunity for AP, which you know, given limitations of scheduling and staffing, we don't always have a wide variety of AP offerings for them. So this would give another layer for that support. <laughs> you sure? About AP data? Then let's get to it. <laughs> okay, great. 
Um, so then we'll start by, we'll jump into the 2022 AP data and, uh, you know, we'll take a moment to brag uh, that PHS was recognized last year uh, at the first annual uh, AP Day celebration as we were one of five high schools who were recognized uh, for prioritizing and focusing on growing our AP programs and consistently ranking in the top schools in Rhode Island for AP student enrollment and the number of students scoring a three or higher. And then we can all take a moment to chuckle about the fact that principal is spelled wrong on that certificate, but I wasn't going to point it out. <laughs> all right. So the first slide that you'll see, we'll talk about uh, enrollment here. Um, so you'll see it's very clear there's a slight downward trend in our enrollment in AP. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that enrollment in general is down at Portsmouth High School. Um, and we did frankly have kind of an enrollment bubble for a time when we did have a policy that said simply taking an AP course would satisfy a, a graduation requirement. And so we had lots of students who maybe maybe weren't interested in the course or taking an AP class, but I'll do that instead of doing a senior project. And so we saw a little bit of a bubble before. And so enrollment is down slightly, um, but I do feel very confident that the students who are taking AP classes now are students who are really interested in the rigor of AP and exploring, you know, opportunities for college credit in their future. Um, so in 2022, we had 232 students enrolled in AP classes. And as you will see, uh, enrollment and exams do not necessarily align because one student counts for one enrollment, but one student could take one exam or one student could take five exams. Um, so we had 400 total exams administered in the 2022 spring AP administration. Uh, and we were at a 75% passing rate. Um, and I think that it's important to note that, you know, in 2021, the entire country, we started the year hybrid and it was a mess. And so everybody saw a dip in 2021. Um, but I do think it's important to note that we are actually at above pre-COVID passing rates at this point. So we were in the upper 60s uh, prior to 2020, and now we're up in the 75%. Of course, we want to see that be higher, and with enrollment down, we would we want to see the 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 passing rate continue to go up. But we are encouraged by the trends. Passing rate three. Yes. Yeah, so according to the College Board, a passing rate is three, and I you know candidly, we want to see that number be higher because we do know that colleges, not all colleges expect accept a three; they want fours and fives. So we are we're not satisfied, and we're not settling with a seventy five percent passing rate if passing equals three we are continuing to push that bar. So the next couple of slides, we'll just review our English mean, our, our mean scores on all of the AP assessments. Um, and so our English classes, quite frankly, are rocking. They are doing a really exceptional job. So uh, our mean score is 4.7, 4.07, excuse me, for AP Lit and 3.34 for AP Lang. And just to put that in perspective, the Rhode Island mean score is 2.89 and the global mean score is 2.83. In math, uh, we have a 3.17 mean score for AP Stats, a 3 for Calc AB and a 3.81 for Calc BC. So that's Calculus AB, they're different, they're divided up differently. Um, and again, just for perspective, the Rhode Island mean is 2.47 for stats, and the global mean is 2.89. Uh, for Calc AB, it's 2.78 in Rhode Island, 2.81 at the global. And uh, for Calc BC, it's 3.61 in Rhode Island and 3.69 at the global level. So we are generally outpacing our local and international peers. Our, yes, sir. I mean international, that's right. Because I was thinking that nationally, but you really mean I really mean global. Yep. Anybody who's taking an advanced placement course in anywhere in the in the planet Earth. <laughs> um, so for our science courses, you know, once again, I don't I don't want to keep reading at you. You can read this fairly well, but again, we are generally outperforming. Um, you know, one area that I do think stands out is that AP Chem. And I do want to just address that we had a pretty low enrollment in AP Chem last year. We had five students. Three of them earned threes and fours two of them earned a one. So our average is a little low. Again, we're not satisfied with that. We do want to continue to push that, but I think it's important to address the fact that that 2.2 is an average of five student scores. Uh, in social studies, 
we have a little bit of work to do in our social studies courses and you know we'll be candid about that um but going back to the point we made earlier particularly in our u.s history ap u.s history the majority of the enrollment for that course are sophomores this is their very first exposure to an advanced placement course we don't have prerequisites for AP. We don't require that students have any sort of passing threshold in other grades because we don't want to block anybody from that experience. Um, so again, one of the reasons we're hoping to fold in the AP capstone, which would support sophomores, would be to expand their experience with the AP program, which we hope would then transfer some of those skills and bolster some of our scores in other areas. And finally, we have our art mean scores. Um, and again, we're we're doing we are generally outpacing the state and, and the globe, um, but we do have some areas of improvement. And I think that this year we're going to see some differences where it's moved to an exclusively digital online portfolio for art and a paper based portfolio is tricky for lots and lots and lots of reasons. So we are hoping that just the simple fact of having an electronic portfolio for students will mitigate some of the issues that we've seen there. We are ever evolving and ever working with our teachers and our department chairs in AP to make sure that it's the best experience for students and that they're getting scores that will earn them authentic college credit when they leave PHS. I'm kind of surprised at the art scores because usually there's like gold medals, silver medals. And again, I think some of that has to do with enrollment. Our enrollment numbers were a little bit low in art for last year. Um, and I'm not sure, to, frankly, what the reason is for that enrollment. But again, we saw, for example, in the 2D art, it was, you know, three students got a very high score and one student got a low score. So the average doesn't come out great. Um, but but yeah, I think that there's there's work to be done. And I think we have opportunities to get that work done. And then the last uh, piece, the last couple of pieces here is just, again, another brag. We did have three courses that had a 90 to 100% passing rate. Um, and of course, the standout is our English literature and composition taught by the English department chair, Don Carrara, with a 100% passing rate in English literature. Our AP bio has a 94% passing rate and our AP and bio class has a 94% passing rate, which is very, very impressive. And the last bit here is just a quick overview of our uh, EEP, early enrollment programs, which are courses that students take at PHS to earn concurrent uh, credit at the college level, whether it be URI, Rhode Island College, or University of Maine in certain cases. And you'll see here uh, that we have 117 students enrolled in the program this year. And again, while those numbers may look like they're on the decline, I actually think it's more a factor it's attributed more to the fact that we're diversifying our offerings at the high school and giving them more things to to opt into. Um, so yeah, any questions about any of that? Um, <laughs> when you were talking about new AP courses, if US government and politics already covers like civics, like, or if that is, if there's like a need for, um, history course that is really specialized on civic participation, you know, like government 101. <laughs> So we, uh, so civics right now currently is offered to all ninth graders. So all ninth graders are required to take civics as a general education okay. requirement. Um, and the AP is offered to our upperclassmen to take yeah. that. Yeah. And then also um, with the AP art, um, perhaps there'd be more interest and, and um, if there is AP photography, has, has that been? Actually, so the AP 2D art is is has a large uh, photography component taught by uh, Ms. Escobar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question. So it looked across the board, the highest um, mean score was in your AP Physics uh, C Mechanical. Uh, can you tell me the difference between that and AP Physics C E&M? Yeah, so E&M is uh, electronics and magnetism. Um, and so students who take that physics course have the option of taking one or both of those assessments, um, but they are scored separately, even though the curriculum all takes place in the same course. In your opinion, why is that score so much higher than kind of across the board what we're seeing? Uh, you know, I think it's a great question. Um, a lot of it just has to, we know that 
results come from great teachers, right? And we had uh, Dave Innes was teaching that course for a long, long time. He was a physics oriented person. Um, and so he was, he was very, very skilled at teaching that. Um, but I think that there was also, I think there's a connection between our students who are very skilled in math and high level math, and they're being encouraged by the math teachers to take the AP physics courses. And so they're coming to those courses with a very secure skill set in that area. And so they're they're able to just accelerate the learning in other areas. And and what is your approximate enrollment in that classes that does that have again a low student count? So no, no, that's actually and and this year actually um, so last year was one person who taught that course and now we've divided them up among two different course uh, teachers who teach the physics one and teach physics C and I would I believe their enrollment they're at almost max capacity in those classes. Fantastic, thank you. Absolutely. I got two or three questions. Um, Ninety-six dollars for the cost of the exam. Um, I assume that most people who sign, most students who sign up for the um, advanced placement courses, intend to take the exam. I suspect they don't all. But those, do any of, are any of the students discouraged from taking it because they don't have? <laughs> Sorry, we need a Santa break. <laughs> He sees you when you're in school committee. <laughs> what a nuisance. <laughs> Santa's a nuisance. Um, so no, so no, to answer your question, cost is absolutely never a barrier to students taking uh, the exam. So we do have something in our program of studies that says that to, to encourage and incentivize students to sit for the AP exam, because we say, my goodness, you put in all this work, at least take a shot at the college credit by taking the exam. Um, we do have something in our program of studies that says, if you if you elect not to, that's okay, but you, we do want you to take a final exam in that course so we have an assessment of your learning in that course ultimately. Um, but we have, there are waivers in place depending on students, you know, free and reduced lunch status, things like that. We also have, a pretty significant cushion in our testing budget to pay for anyone who might have a financial hardship. And we are very transparent about that in all of our communication to families and students. Um, I, I, I read most of the, uh, the student, um, the program of studies earlier today, and I want to compliment everybody on, on the, um, the way the program's written. I think it's really, I know it's a collaborative effort, but I, I think that um, it's just written very well. Um, I'm you. looking at one of them, financial algebra honors, and it says um, financial algebra is a college prep mathematics course aligned to common core standards. So that prompts me to ask, we haven't heard about common core for quite a while now. So are we adhering to common core? Who's, who's responsible for the common core standards? Because as I'm sure you know, a few years ago, common core was supposed to be approved across the country and it became a political football and a lot of states just said the hell with it. And um, but Rhode Island didn't. I think we're closely aligned to Massachusetts. We are indeed. And, but um, but where, are the, where, where are the common core standards being originated now? So we're still generally speaking following the common core standards, but of course, you know, we, we make it our own where we can. So we, for science, we follow NGSS, which are the next generation science standards for English and math, we do adhere largely to the common core state standards. And for social studies, of course, there's also new guidance coming out from RIDE with the reimagining high schools and, and the new graduation requirements that we're looking at. Um, but we, our social studies has been actually very tightly aligned to the Massachusetts frameworks. Okay. My last question is um, STEAM. We haven't heard, when I joined the school committee 10 years ago, STEAM was constantly talked about. And for the last several years, I mean, granted the, the COVID year was a big interruption, but I haven't heard anything about STEAM. I'm not overly concerned about it. I'm just wondering where it is in the grand scheme of things. I think it lives in CTE now, really. I think that our CTE programs are 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 giving that comprehensive science technology uh, application for students. So I think the jargon has changed a little bit, but I I, I don't think the approach has changed that much. Great. Any other? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, five in favor, zero opposed, and one, no, one, two, three, four, two, or five, five in favor, one, no opposed, and one abstention. Um, all right. Uh, can I have a motion for the consent agenda, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Obviously. Uh, unanimous. Any opposed? Unanimous 6-0. Um, uh, Dr. Kenworthy, do you want to say what that was? Uh, uh, sure. So you approved a request uh, for Mr. Cassidy, who also runs our uh, close-up program at Portsmouth High School for uh, he and his students to begin preparing for uh, the national um, project close up uh, in Washington, DC from the 26th through March 4th. Uh, it's a lot of fundraising that needs to take place there, Mr. Cassidy, I, I know. And uh, Absolutely. all right, excellent. Okay, uh, can I have a motion for business A, please? Well, I move for discussion and action on the Portsmouth High School program of studies. Second. Discussion. Obviously, the presentation uh, that you heard, and you have the backup um, in 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 your backup materials. Uh, so you're officially approving program of study, so that after the new year, the high school can begin the scheduling process for next year. So I guess my question is the the business and finance courses. I mm -hmm. get they're gonna they're they've listed the timeline here. This a this um, capstone course is this for next year? So we want. To And the community learning is for next year. Yes. I have sort of a backup question on history. So Joe Cassidy. Um, <laughs> North Korea, Vietnam. <laughs> We're, <laughs> yeah. We're on the program of studies. <laughs> that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm referring to. I'm just wondering. We don't, I asked you this a similar question once before. In the general studies of modern world history, I guess we don't. We really don't even get through World War II, I think. And and my point is, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from Korea, Vietnam, I Iran, I mean, Iraq and Afghanistan. Are you asking me if I want to increase what we offer for social studies? <laughs> That's not exactly how I'd put it, but <laughs> um, because I'm involved in the budget. Understood. And I seek your support. <laughs> Right now with our world history course, there is not as much as I think I would prefer for the coverage of those subject areas. Uh, you move through four major sort of continental subject areas through the year, basically spread into quarters. Um, for U.S. history, we do cover those subject areas. Uh, but right now, our U.S. history curriculum takes us from basically 1914 to the present. Um, I would say that Korea probably doesn't take as much time as I'd like to devote to it just for how we devote our time, but Vietnam certainly does. And so I look at sort of the policy issues of those theaters of operation. And generally at that point in time, we're in the midst of the Cold War, and I'm looking at it from that point of view. So I know in U.S. history, we cover it. I'd still like to cover it better. I mean, if you want me to introduce a modern war class, I think we could probably get that done in a semester. Um, I'm not sure who would teach it, but I have ideas. Um, so I, I think that we do cover those. I don't know that we ever give the amount of depth that I would prefer, um, but certainly they're not being neglected. Certainly. Dr. Kenworthy, if we, yes. if I guess having come from a finance subcommittee meeting where I was totally scared about next year's budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, if we approve this program of studies, are we approving the staffing that goes with it? I mean, are we committing ourselves to staffing? So, I, I mean, I, ideally, yes. However, uh, these process will, processes will, will run concurrently. So as you know, we're, you're approving this now so that the high school can stay on their timeline to begin their scheduling process. However, while that's happening, we will also be going through the budget process. And as that picture becomes clearer, that's what will ultimately dictate our uh, FTE, our number of staff across the district, including at the high school, 
So they will be limited as well by the number of staff that we're able to have in the budget. Um, and in an ideal world, that matches up with student scheduling requests, but it's it's the life that every high school lives, you know, will be living in the spring of next year is trying to kind of make those, those two things. And, you know, they'll work with myself and Dr. Viveros and we just have to make it work every year, but it will work within the kind of confines of the you know, number of staff members that we're able to accommodate in the budget. So hypothetically, if let's say the soft hundred students in the sophomore class say they want to do this AP seminar, mm -hmm. we have to we have to accommodate them if we approve this, or do we say, sorry, we've only got teachers teaching two sections, so it's 50 students or whatever the number is. Yep. So again, we just it's the life that every high school administrator and central office administrator will, will be living as we work our way through the budget process in the spring is that we have to make those things work together. So I mean the, the, are we on the financial hook if we approve this to staff these courses? If you if you say no, then I'll vote for right, it. Yeah, if you say yes, so I will the, say I don't think I can approve it yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean the answer is no because I mean we would hate to do it, but ultimately if we didn't have if the budget wasn't supporting that we could run a particular cost uh, course and even though students had signed up for it, you know, we would have to make that tough choice when the time comes. So you know, you, you, we're not, you're not ultimately on the okay. hook for anything at this point. Right. You're approving the program of study so that the high school can begin their scheduling process. That will run concurrently as we are working out what we need to in the budget process. We've had that issue with the engineering course. When we started offering engineering, we, we were oversubscribed by a lot in the first couple of years, I believe, or even three or four no, years. No, but I think that- We didn't know, I mean, I'm just saying- No, no, I, it's, it's just that I think we're in a position where we're gonna have a pretty tight budget year, and I'm just worried if we make a promise we can't keep. But as long as I've been reassured that we're giving planning authority as opposed to fulfillment authority, then I'm, I'm okay with this. <laughs> but that's my personal view. Right. And then, I mean, yeah, so as, as if students are signing up, I mean, there's only so much room in a student schedule at the high school as well. So if, you know, a higher number of students are signing up for a particular course, that just naturally works itself out usually within the scheduling yeah, process. Yeah, but you have to be AP certified to teach this class, right? I mean, you have to be yes. certified in this. And I mean, Another example would be the the accounting class. I can imagine there there might be significant interest in an accounting class, right? So, mm -hmm. if if that's something that you have to have a certain skill set for, I mean, it, that would either mean hiring somebody. Well, but we'd have to hire you, and you're too expensive. So, I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I'm sure we have people on, on staff. Current right. But school, no, but I thought but, you said account, I used accounting because I thought you said that might require some additional staffing, right? Right. So, I mean, again, I, I think these are wonderful. I want to give Portsmouth high school students all the options they can have. And I love the creativity and the energy coming out of the high school. And, you know, you want to say, go for it. But at the same time, I just want to make sure that if we're saying go for it and you know other and reality inter intervenes we're not we had a similar problem with the AP exam when we said take the AP exam and then we ended up having to pay for all the AP exams right now it's it's voluntary and we have support for students who can't afford it and that's that's what the budget can afford right but I, I think you've answered my question so I don't want to beat this issue any any further than it is so Ms. Blank. Um, I have a concern with, to kind of footstomp what you had mentioned before on the two-year capstone for the senior project. Um, I agree that should be a one-year, one semester, two semester, uh, but within one year. Um, it's just my concern that for a full year, the only output is a 15-page paper uh, on that second part. But if it, it was then in tandem um, of, one semester of of that research research methods. part. The second part of the year was um, the paper. That makes more sense to me. Um, by uh, 
by voting for this, are we, do we take it as is that this would be two years? Or would there be room for negotiation or flexibility on it? Yeah, I I will leave that one to Dr. Viveros yeah. as far. Again, I, I, I don't think for any AP course, I mean, I know, you know my daughter attended another high school. She, she took some of the same AP courses that we offer full year in one semester. I, I don't think you're tied to the, the time frame. So we would have to, again, make that work within the schedule that we have. And I can certainly meet with the high school team and look into it further. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, uh, I'll call the vote for, uh, bless you, uh, approval of the PHS uh, program of studies. All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous, um, six zero. Thank you very much for the time yep. and presentation. All of that, we appreciate it. Um, uh, business B, please. Move for discussion and action on uh, the Council 94 Local 2669 contract. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous, 6-0. And might I say we're very, very pleased to have concluded the negotiations. Thank oh, you very yeah. much. So, yay. We'll be happy to sign any paperwork after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, can I have a motion for business C, please? Move for discussion and action on the contract renewal for our director of finance. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous, 6-0. Um, thank you and congratulations and we appreciate it. <laughs> Um, can I have a motion for business D, please? I move for discussion and action on updates to the district substitute and part-time rates for fiscal year 2023. Second. Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. So typically, uh, this is an item we bring to you uh, once a year in June. So you did approve uh, our substitute and part-time rates you know, for this current school year last June. Uh, we've never done this in, while I've been superintendent or even in my time here. In the district, but I, I'm bringing this to you for a, a mid-year, um, you know, uh, correction or update, if you will, and just be, based on difficulty that we're seeing in in, in uh, filling some some of our substitute positions, I'm asking um, you to approve this uh, increased rate for our our daily sub rate. And I um, I should mention that this went through personnel subcommittee um, as well, and we looked at a comparison of various districts. Um, brings us a little bit more in line, more brings us in line with some other districts. So uh, we were we were lower. Um, question um, on the special ed aid, the school year substitution. It's crossed out, and there's no. Um, new number, uh, are we removing that or are we updating it? I think we're just going to that 1750 number, which Across had, the board. Been, yeah, had been the ESY okay. number. We're just saying that that would be, that's an, again, another um, area that's been difficult for us to fill. Okay, thank you. So this is it, you're not gonna come back again at the end of the year. Uh, uh, no, yeah, no, I will, uh, okay. hopefully this will get us through the rest of the year. All right. Uh, uh, how difficult has it been or, or where are the shortcomings and can you kind of quantify that for us? Yeah, uh, so we talked about in uh, personnel subcommittee. So typically, um, you know, we during COVID and we've kept in place, we added a building substitute for each school. That, you know, that helps the overall general picture. But, you know, we do track our uh, daily fill rate for substitutes. So typically if we're at like 75 to 80 percent. We know we can cover that you know, shortfall with the building sub and, and you know, we have mechanisms that teachers can pitch in here and there. Uh, around October, we noticed our, our, our fill rate just plummet consistently uh, down into the 30s, 40s some days. And it was really driven uh, by one, one community locally um, raised their sub rates um, quite a bit. Um, and, and it just really kind of pulled the, you know, supply of subs, if, if you would, to that district. So, uh, most local districts have either done what we're doing or, or are going to be following suit just to kind of stay competitive. All right. All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous 6-0.
um, for discussion and action for the Melville and Hathaway HVAC project submission to the Rhode Island Department of Education School Building Authority for the schematic design review. Second. Mr. Dero. Yep, so this is uh, the first of many uh, votes tonight you'll be taking. So as you know, we've been hard at work at uh, fulfilling our, our um, five-year capital plan, so um, funded by the uh, town bond from last year. Um, the Melville and Hathaway HVAC projects are a summer 2024 uh, scheduled project, and uh, we're asking for approval to submit the first of three stages to ride. And again, all of these that we'll talk about have gone through the Capitol. Uh, I mean, the uh, building committee have been uh, approved. Yeah, and um, Emily, just for your information, these are required steps for the bond where it has to go through the building committee, then, then we have to approve it. And then it goes like basically three rounds. So it can be adjusted at any one of those, but it's to keep everybody informed and on track pretty much, right? Absolutely, yep. Any questions? All right, all in favor? Next. I move for discussion and action for the Melville Roof Replacement Project submission to the Rhode Island Department of Education School Building Authority for the Design Development Review. Second. Mr. Giro. Yep. So uh, again, this is the uh, final uh, large uh, but final portion of the Melville uh, roof um, that we would like to replace. It'll be 100% new over the last five years. Uh, this is a summer 2023 project. Uh, would go out to bid probably sometime in February um, after the uh, holidays. And this is um, requesting uh, approval for the second of the three, uh, the design development um, review to ride. All right. Seeing no questions, all in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous 6 0. I just have a, a quick question. Oh. So, if we have a heavy snowfall, I mean, blizzard like condition, do we, do we have anybody go up onto the roofs of our schools to clean it off the, because of the weight of the snow and so forth? Yes, we have in the past. Okay. Yep. It's rare, but it happened. Yes. <laughs> Um, with like potential federal funding coming, um, are have have there been discussions about solar panels on roofs at school facilities? I haven't have not opened a can of worm, but just just mm -hmm. curious if like this roof replacement is like taking that into consideration. So we have had discussions, and in fact, it's on the agenda for tomorrow's building committee. Okay. And um, I had a conversation with the Newport Building Committee Chair about what they're doing with uh, the Pell and the, the new high school down there. And they are um, making sure that not only all their roofs are solar ready, but that also the, the driveways and the parking lot areas have the conduits in case they end up doing the, the solar panels over the parking areas. Okay. Um, the problem is... Uh, that most of the federal incentives right now are tied to tax rebates, and these are tax-free loans. Mm -hmm. So there's there's not, right now at least, there's kind of not an obvious way to catch, capture that. Um, but as Mr. Dero um, mentioned, it's on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Next. I move for discussion and action on the Hathaway Elevator Project submission to the Rhode Island Department of Education School Building Authority for the Design De Development Review. Second. So again, this is another 2024 project, so it's pretty far out, but it has a really, really long lead time uh, procurement-wise um, for an elevator. So we're uh, asking for permission uh, to submit for the second uh, phase, uh, which is the Design Development Review. Okay. Any other? No. All right. All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous. Six zero. Move for discussion and act, action on for the bathroom renovation project submission to the Rhode Island Department of Education School Building Authority uh, for the construction doc construction documentation review of Hathaway Melville and Portsmouth High School. Second. So this is an upcoming uh, summer project, and we're asking uh, permission for the uh, final phase um, submission for the construction documentation review, uh, after which we'll go out to bid. So um, could you tell me what were the changes that were made at the district building committee from the previous submission to this one? 
I don't think there were any major changes. Just to ask. Yeah, nothing, nothing um, of any material. Okay. It's probably worth pointing out or having the discussion that um, again we, we had made the decision um, at previous uh, school building committee and it was approved through you know previous submissions there that we're holding back on the, the middle school bathroom projects till uh, summer of 2024. Several reasons, um, you know, not the least of which is it will allow us to keep one building open next summer so that we can run summer programming. Next item, please. Did you did you approve? Oh, do we approve it? Uh, call for the vote. All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous six zero. Smiling at me. <laughs> I move discussion and action for the high school field house HVAC project submission to the Rhode Island Department of Education School Building Authority for the construction documentation review. Second. That can't happen fast enough. <laughs> Mr. Dero. Uh, this is another summer 2023 project. It's it's far along uh, final phase uh, approval we're looking for tonight for construction documentation. Again, we'll go out to bid in January. So we can hope and expect maybe that it will be done this summer. That is and the plan. The only um, unknown is the procurement process and whether or not uh, equipment will be available quickly so we on all of these projects we really don't do we do we have a good feel for whether we're on budget or not uh we get budget updates on every one of the three phases um some are coming under some are over um we are um going out to bid to get hard costs and then from there we'll have discussions about whether or not we you know we need to make scope changes or not it's just a very weird time to be mm -hmm. getting numbers so we want to get real actual firm bids. I mean, the nice thing was from last summer's projects, those all came in under budget. They did. Which gave a little bit of a cushion, but with inflation and prices, I mean, I think everybody's holding their breath for the next round too. They are. And a lot of the estimators are also worrying about being very, very conservative so they don't get blamed if a project comes over. So we just, we really have to go out the bid and get firm budget prices. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Unanimous 6 0. Um, I'd like to move for discussion and action of JLCDA medical marijuana policy. This is our final read. Have a second, please. Second. Were there any changes? Not since the last meeting, no. Okay. Um, I, 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 I feel concerned that even if you have a medical, um, prescription that the impact on other students, um, the health impacts from being surrounded in an educational setting um, can hinder, is, is prohibitive. Like to me, I think this creates a, you know, a smoking condition that I don't think should, is appropriate at a school. Well, there are a couple of things. One is um, this, what we're talking about here is a prescription medication that's provided by a doctor yeah. in their care of a particular patient. And that's not something that is the business of schools. You know, yeah. for us to take on the task of going to families and saying, we don't agree with what your doctor has indicated as the best thing for your child's health is really outside the scope of what yeah. The schools are tasked with doing. The second thing, just on a practical level, as it says in the policy, these medications, like all prescription medications, are given in a nurse's office. Okay. And there are limitations in the policy itself about how it can be given. My, I'm not a doctor, but my understanding is that, um, you know, this is not like reefer madness, you know, like there's, they're, these are not kids smoking joints. This is either. There are um, other delivery methods. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, it said school sponsored events. And so I would feel comfortable if it was administered in a nurse's office. Um, I just think it's a slippery slope to have school sponsored events. Where did you, where are you seeing school sponsored events? I'm just not sure where you. Um, philosophy. So that. Uh, yeah, the, basically, I just read in the second paragraph of the philosophy, um, or the first paragraph, while in school or at school-sponsored events. So it must 
last sentence, first mm -hmm. paragraph. Right. I think what we're primarily talking about there is um, field trip. What about um, like the sporting events and the, because I don't see um, kind of a, the designated location is what is concerning to me because the enforcement is going to be challenging. Um, the ease of access, honestly. And um, I still feel outside of a, a, a nurse's office, um, it could be a, unruly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think we were intending this to take place outside of the, the nurse's office. And I, I believe this is a required policy now that districts have to have attorney Carol. Right. So they were never from the education it's required that we have this policy. Um, and they have sent us a sample um, months ago that we mm -hmm. have. Keeping in mind, it's not like a child can have medical marijuana on them mm -hmm. and take it at the discretion. It's always going to be administered by a nurse or a parent. So it's and it's not smoking, it's usually pills, gummies, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it's only under prescription. And the same with any other prescription that a doctor um, should um, uh, determine is needed. We have to have the prescription, we have to have you know the orders from the doctor. And again, we don't let students carry around any prescription. It, mm -hmm. it's all our nurses have to have to administer any prescription. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to see somebody at a school dance legally taking medical marijuana because at that point it would be illegal and we would be stopping. So I mean, again, it's a prescription that can only be administered by a nurse or by a parent that would come in and do it. Now, if a child is on a field trip and for some reason they need any prescription, then we have to send a nurse. Mm -hmm. yeah. If a child who is on um, the track team and needs a prescription, then we have we'll have to get a nurse down to that particular activity to give them. So there's no way that they're taking any pill or any prescription on the way. Mm -hmm. And again, this was a required policy by the Rhode Island Department. And that's just in the same way that insulin would be handled for a child who's diabetic or any other Ritalin for a kid who has ADHD, you know, any other medication that would be prescribed. For Ms. Keehan does have a point, though. There's nowhere in this policy. I mean, it talks about the nurse's office, but there's nowhere in this policy that elaborates the statement you said right there that, you know, when at school-sponsored events, it's only to be administered by but it says here, or at school-sponsored right. events. Right, but I'm just saying that's not in the policy. I mean, your point about it implies that it could be taken at a school-sponsored so event. There, there's, yeah. I was going to say, I don't have that one open, but we had policy. that one. Well, I can yeah, we have a... It is. a administering meta medicine policy so we okay so that would be covered under that other yeah policy. so it's almost like this is an addendum to that policy yeah. but we by you know ride um ask each district to have a separate policy specifically addressing medical marijuana okay all right we do have to vote on this one though because it says action so um, feel free to vote against if you're not comfortable. Um, all in favor? Any opposed? I uh, uh, affirmed. Uh, my math is off tonight. Five on one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, reports. Uh, we're receiving the Portsmouth School Department OPEP budget. Mr. Dero. Sure. So uh, this is the district's OPEP valuation as of uh, June 30th, 2022. Um, just um, for everybody's benefit, OPEB uh, is an acronym stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits, and for us, that uh, is retiree health care. Uh, it does not include pensions. Uh, the report contains uh, required disclosures regarding the future cost uh, of providing these retiree health care benefits uh, to our employees uh, and uh, will be included in the town's annual audited financial statements. Um, there's a footnote in there with quite a bit of this information. 
Uh, most of the report is pretty um, heavy on actuarial calculations, uh, but section one, starting on page three, does contain an executive summary that provides uh, the key information uh, that you'd probably be uh, most interested in. Uh, we currently have 16 retirees uh, receiving health benefits, uh, which is uh, five less than the prior year. The net OPEB liability is now $2,989,482, which is a reduction of $581,000 from the prior year. Uh, there are a number of factors in, uh, impacting the reduction, but the largest one is the change in discount rate, um, which uh, increased uh, to 4.09% from 2.19. Uh, that rate is um, prescribed in, um, in the um, accounting literature on how you calculate that. And it's basically the uh, municipal bond in index, which as everybody know, uh, knows, uh, rising interest rates uh, recently um, are really impacting that and driving those uh, yields way up. Uh, lastly, I would just point out that um, if you are interested in, in doing a detailed review uh, of the report, there's a very helpful glossary of terms uh, on page 35 that uh, if you were to recommend reading that first before taking a look at the report. Thank you. So I have a question. You've digested the report. Um, in your opinion, are, do we have any significant OPEB liability that we should be worried about? Or are we up to now, we've been covering everything as we go. Um, we haven't been, we have the reserve OPEB money, which last time I heard, we really probably don't need to have in reserve uh, based on how we're restructuring it now. So. Sure. Yeah, I can, I can give you my thoughts on that. So um I think back in 2013, when I started here, that OPEB liability was like $12 million. Um, there are a number of reasons why it's gone down. Um, the um, uh, certified employee retirement um, changes, um, we've negotiated um, any changes in some of our collective bargaining agreements. So it's gone from about 12 million <clears throat> down to under three. Um, I want to say it was costing us probably $350,000 a year back then, pay as you go. Uh, this year, it cost us about $60,000. Um, I, I just don't think based on um, what our employees, um, how old they need to be and how many years they have to be here to qualify for health care that we have a significant exposure. We also made some adjustments in the uh, last NEA collective bargaining agreement. Um, that reduced the number of potential years from nine to six. That's not reflected in here because that doesn't take effect until September 1. This is as of June 30th. So uh, my recommendation is continue the course. Um, we can certainly um, continue to pay, pay as you go through our regular operating budget. And I don't think there's a reason to start an OPEP trust or anything like that. Okay. Do you think we need to have, I think it's 300,000 that we've, 350, 340? 340. 340. Do you think it's still prudent to keep that in a special reserve fund, or is that something that may not be needed anymore? Yeah, so I think that was established years ago with, with the intention to put that money to establish an OPEB trust. Um, the district never did that. Um, I think at one point they actually had gone out to bid for it, but never awarded. If we're not going to put the money in an OPEB trust and we're not going to have a plan to fully fund the $3 million necessary to have that completely funded, and I'd say, no, I don't think that money should should be there. It's not really doing anything. I would recommend we, at some point, consider freeing that up and perhaps putting it back in capital or, or some other need. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, we don't vote on that. We just received the report. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we do, This is our only meeting in December. Uh, our next meeting will be after the new year, January 17th. Um, and um, in light of uh, Superintendent uh, Ken, Superintendent Kenworthy's reminder about the legislature meeting coming up. If anybody has any um, thoughts on what we should be asking our legislators for or not to do, <laughs> goes both ways. Um, we can. We'll definitely be asking for that. So keep that in mind. Um, we wish everybody a wonderful, safe, happy holiday season. A, a chance to recharge and relax and. Um, May I have a motion for adjournment, please? Second. All in favor? Unanimous 6-0. Thank you very much.